Um, okay, so welcome everyone uh, and welcome to our virtual audience. Uh, Veronica has organized a webinar, so we've got lots of people joining us from far away. And um, oh, all of a sudden I got really nervous. <laughs> Deep breath. <laughs> and don't and don't stand on your toes. <laughs> I watch writers like this, but we're gonna fall over and you can't because you stop doing that. You gotta stay grounded. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, I want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Haida Nation. And before we begin, no, I already said that. Oh, there will be a question and answer period at the end. So just so you know. And then I pulled a lovely thing from Susan's bio because I think it really um, is kind of perfect that I want to read. Susan Musgrave has been labeled everything from eco-feminist to anti-feminist, from stand-up comedian to poet of doom and gloom, <laughs> from social and political commentator to wild sea witch of the Northwest Coast. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> My life is a joke, I know. <laughs> well, what I was gonna say is that um, Susan's work is really personal. Oh God, everything's fine. It's fine, it's fine, sorry. <laughs> and um, we're really honored to have her and to call her our neighbor. We're really lucky to have Susan among us. So oh, thank you. Um, and tonight, Susan will be reading from her book, The Sculptory Lilies, that has been selected for the shortlist for the prestigious 2023 Griffin Poetry Prize. We're all rooting for you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Etchie. Um, yes, who writes those things, those little blurbs that are on my website? I probably did, but I just sort of stole from all the journalists and put things together. Um, one of the occupational hazards of being a writer is a feeling of low self-esteem, low self-worth. You you wouldn't think so, but um, it, it I think it is. We all, I didn't hear back from an editor after 24 hours of writing a piece on the height of potatoes. So I wrote to him saying, because he's a friend, and I said, um, if you didn't like it um, or if it wasn't right for you, please don't feel awkward, just uh, I'll try again. <laughs> He wrote back, no, no, we all loved it. I just, you know, but I hear I was thinking, oh, because I've been here for 24 hours and I'm already anxious. I think that's, geez, after 70 years of writing, whatever it is, I guess I'm never going to change. Um, so Ruth from the Griffin Prize, the, the long list was announced in um, March and there were 10 of us and it included three of my favorite American poets. And every other year, there's been a Canadian component and an international component. So they decided that this year Canada could stand on a world stage. And so the, the three, there are three, I think four Americans. Oh, well, there's an Egyptian Canadian, there's me, and the other three are American poets. One's the poet laureate, she's amazing. Ocean Bianc Wong, who's I teach in my poetry class, he's fabulous. So it's quite uh, nerve wracking. It's like waiting for test results, but I've always uh, eschewed prizes and been very disparaging about them until I was shortlisted. And now I think prizes are great. <laughs> anyway, so she called me at 7.15 and normally the only people calling at that time were the scammers who was telling me my visa card has been compromised, my Amazon account. So I, I, I unplugged the phone, but I didn't that night and it, I could hear that it was Ruth from the Griffin Prizes. So I thought, oh, she's calling to say, you didn't win, but, but you know, good luck, good, good on you for trying or, for, you know, for getting long listed. And so I just sat, lay in bed with my cat and then got up, went downstairs, listened to the message again. And she said, oh, you're shortlisted. Congratulations. Oh, right. I know. So that was, quite, and then I was very calm. I went to make my tea and I poured the boiling water into the canister of tea leaves instead of into the teapot. But <laughs> really, <laughs> at that point, I realized, okay, maybe I'm not as calm as I think I'm going to be. I, I, I meant to start by thanking Etchi and Patrick and Veronica for organizing this. I'm sorry, you're supposed to be Canadian and thank everybody to begin with. I, I, I sometimes forget to do that. So I'm very appreciative of, your, of everything you've done. So uh, the book that's... Uh, was this is the long I love stickers I'm just like a child of grade one I like gold stars now I but this is a red sticker but maybe being shortlisted I'll get a different color sticker anyway so this means long listed and there'll be another one coming exculpatory lilies comes from the title comes from a New Yorker cartoon there's a woman opening a bouquet of flowers and she says to her husband it's been ages since she's 
gave me exculpatory lilies. And it means exonerated from guilt. A lot of poets can't even pronounce it. Lorna Crozier, every time she says it, she sort of says, you know, your lily's book. <laughs> but she can't pronounce exculpatory. It's a legal term. Usually I don't like Latinates or I don't know if that's Greek or Latin, but I but I like the contrast of a of a of an Im image like lilies with a with a, a more vague abstraction. I think anyway. Um, so now I have to go to this award ceremony in Toronto. And of course, my first thought was I have nothing to wear because I live on Haida Gwaii and we don't go to <laughs> And there's no dance store anymore. <laughs> so she said, oh, don't worry. Most writers feel that way. And so Don Mackay said, I guess I better buy a new sweatshirt, he said. It's a kind of black tie thing, which is, you know, I don't have a black tie. But anyway, so I found this article a few days ago by Stephen Marsh in, um, I think it's in the New Yorker too, called A Writer's Lament, The Better You Write, The More You Fail. And it's got some, one, so I'll just read this short paragraph that I think is, is perfect for the situation. A paradox defines writing. The public sees writers mainly in their victories, but their lives are spent mostly in defeat. I suppose that's why in the rare moments of triumph, writers always look a little out of place, posing in magazine profiles in their half-considered outfits with their last minute hair or at the ceremonies for writing prizes, the Oscars for lumpy people, grinning like recently released prisoners readjusting <laughs> to society. So I kind of fit all those categories, uh, especially the last one, since I spent a lar large part of my life visiting Stephen in prison. Um, so that's my lead into my poem about visiting him at William Head, which of course is supposed to be the club fed of prisons. Um, it, it, yes, that's what they call it. It's um, um, on the sea, and so the visiting cabins are have this beautiful view of the Olympic Peninsula. Stephen used to say that being in prison in a beautiful place was more difficult because you couldn't find the prison in it. Like if you're surrounded by razor wire and just dirt, so you know you're in prison. But at William Head, it was so beautiful. But it had been a, a native uh, banishment site, a First Nations banishment site. Then it was where the ships came in. Um, and a lot of with people had leprosy and there's a leper colony up, and so a lot of people died, never made it to God. So there's this huge sadness about it, this beauty. Anyway, so I was I was visiting and um, staring out the window as I, I want to do in this poem. It's called Staring at the Window in the Conjugal Visits Cottage, William Head Penitentiary. There has to be a flaw to perfect the view, a smear on the window at eye level where a child has kissed the reflection of her inquisitive lips. If I looked beyond, I could escape into the wide sky that cannot stop wild clouds from flying, but I can't see further than this, the O of her perfect mouth, my own pointless lamenting. When I walk the dark road to meet you, a stone lodges itself inside my shoe. Why don't I stop to shake that pebble free? It's as if we need the reminder each step of the way. It feels comforting, the pain we obey. I do that all the time. I put my shoe on, there's a rock in it. And I think, why don't I just, <laughs> just take the rock out? But no, I walk for two miles with my foot hurting. I don't know what, but then, then you're aware. Like I think it's a kind of Buddhist awareness <laughs> of your foot hurting. <laughs> or else it's laziness. Um, there's a poem for Stephen. This book is mostly poems about my daughter and my husband. Um, there are others, but they inform a lot of it. And this is called Whatever Gets in the Way. There are a lot of local res references in the poems you will recognize. The winds from the southeast today, the day you take the ferry to Alliford Bay, the Air Canada flight to Vancouver. The Kuna trembles, water breaks over her bow. Love what gets in the way, you say, we must love every obstacle. Our last night together, we watched the final episode of Narcos season one. There's not much left of Don Pablo, which I worry is why season two has met with a delay. Did Escobar have any idea his life was destined to become a miniseries on Netflix? He killed whatever got in his way, but he loved his daughter who begged him to buy her a unicorn for her birthday. He bought a horse instead a, and stapled a comb to its head, attached wings to its withers. The horse died of an infection. Pablo earned $60 million a day and buried it about the countryside. He burned bundles of cash to keep his family warm when they were on the lamb. I like that in a man. 
His brother, the accountant, spent $2,500 a month on rubber bands to wrap the bundles in. I paid for your one-way ticket to Vancouver. The only other time I gave you money, you threw it to the wind. $2,500 a month on rubber bands has always amazed me. Like I bought some at the co-op about <laughs> 20 years ago for 59 cents, a little bag, and I still have it. It lost some of their elasticity, but $2,500 a month to wrap your money in. Even if I won the Griffin Award, I wouldn't have to buy that many elastic bands. <laughs> I don't think. $130,000? No, it's not million. That's not $60 million a day. Oh, this is a North Beach poem where I spent a lot of time. Quote uh, our friend Kamiko, poems called The Way the Stubborn Land Goes Soft Before the Sea. That month before Kamiko died, I saw her on the beach. The foam after a north wind had blown all week knee deep. These days when I walk to White Creek, I think of Kamiko, closer to death than I was at the time the way she sat straight against a stranded log waiting. My father said, look your last on all things. And I looked at Kamiko and back at the sea thinking, this is what I will miss too. The surge upon the shore, the herds of sandpipers jinking in and out as the waves break and recede. Now, each time I look, I look my last and then I look again. There was something so poignant about seeing her sitting there watching the waves and think how I take that for granted and I try not to but it's so hard when you're feeling well you just want to get home to your tea or the tea canister full of water in my case brain north um oh this is there are a lot of funny poems in this book I always <laughs> like to entertain audiences because it's easier than making them sad um, but that's just the way it turned out because this book <laughs> I haven't been so happy for the last 10 years. Um, although I do have a kind of black sense of humor, which I think you need to have in order to this tragedy and comedy being born at the hip. Anyway, this poem is called The Truth. I tend to be a kind of know-it-all person, which really irritates me about myself. But when people are wrong, I always want to correct them and say, I've learned not to over the years, but my friends are always mad at me because actually I am right a lot of the time and they don't like that. Patrick Lane will say, you're right again. And then he'd be mad at me. I'd say, well, if I think I'm wrong, I don't say anything, but I'm usually right. But anyway, this is the truth. <laughs> the hitchhiker I picked up a mile outside of Massett claimed he'd been enlightened by buttercups, so many that to stare at them too hard would have induced blindness. All day he had meditated by the ditch and the moment I pulled over in my Jeep Cherokee, he knew he'd been blessed. He'd been waiting his whole life for someone like me. It crossed my mind to tell him those were dandelions, not buttercups. <laughs> but how pleased I am with myself, I refrain. <laughs> I'm learning to refrain more and more. It really doesn't matter. Some of it used to matter to me that people got things right. Um, this is a, I want to read this poem for my bosom friend, Angie Long, who I know is on Zoom or said she was going to be. She may have just said that to make me feel better, but it's her birthday today. So happy birthday, Angie. Happy birthday. Uh, happy birthday, happy birthday, birthday to all your friends in Massive. Uh, Angie used to stay in Meredith's Cabin, the Spare Girl, and uh, I hope she comes back. Uh, every time I talk to her, I, I have to refrain from saying, are you coming back? Because she's sort of I'm not supposed to say gypsy anymore. She's a she's not really Roma. She's a wandering soul. And uh, she's a gypsy. But, uh, <laughs> nobody's offended. Anyway, um, so we used to walk Meredith's dog, Dark Star, to White Creek and back. And, and um, there was a poem about Dark Star's last night or last time, few minutes on, I guess, evening. I read afterwards that dogs, if they're hurt, got backed over by a are and it's New Year's Day and the dogs if they're hurt won't show it because then they're, they're vulnerable to other predators. Uh, somebody else said that's not true their dog whines and is really wimpy. I said well okay but maybe some dogs. The dog star just was stoic. So it's called Elegy. How many times I walked Dark Star to White Creek and sat with her happy watching the gulls headbutt the wind, the ravens dive into the knee-deep foam. 
I'd feed Dark Star her last treat and we'd head for home. Tonight, Dark Star is recollecting the life beyond. What is it that separates the living from the gone? She wags her tail, she drinks, she eats. It means she's hanging on, though every mouthful of meat has the taint of the slaughterhouse in it. The rain doesn't help the grief of it, nor will our tears be enough to keep the cold from dancing Dark Star, dark star outside to chase the wind. Her going saddens everything, the moon, the stars. She who brought us light and darkness has saddened away the sun. You lost your dog recently too, David. Mm -hmm. Sorry to hear that. I've become, living here, everyone has dogs and you start loving them. We be, and then so there was a dog called Toby that was lost and I spent four days in a state of anxiety. It's not even my dog, I'd never seen it before. But I found him walking in front of my house. And so yeah. I was so excited, I, I had to use my cell phone, which today I was on the cell phone and couldn't find it because I was talking on it. So I'm not <laughs> very good at the cell phone, but so I managed to call Dory and my Tamo and they got there. <laughs> but yeah, it was, yeah, it was a lovely. I know, I know. I, uh, especially when you get, then I get excited or disturbed. Then I, then I can't make the phone work. I hit it, and you're supposed to tap. <laughs> I start hitting. So because you're mostly friends in the audience, I thought I would attempt to read um, mm. some poems for Sophie, my daughter. Um, if I start crying, I'll stop because I don't want to cry in Toronto. Um, because you know, in front of. I, I know there's a little place on your ear if you start to cry, you can pinch your ear. So if I do this, but no, I'm not, it's not some weird tick I've developed just to stop myself from trying. It's really amazing. A naturopath put a seed in my ear and said, just, just pinch this every time you want to cry. Because when my cat got run over, I, if someone said hello to me, I'd start crying. So that wasn't, you know, useful really to be in the shop, the co-op and <laughs> hello and then weep, you know, later. Um, so this is a series called The Goodness of This World that I wrote when she was on the street, I guess 2012, and the only way I could sort of save myself was to write poems about the situation. And um, the preface is God Loves a Drug Dealer, which is a graffiti I saw in Vancouver. She forced you to cut your hair, hack it off in front of those you counted as friends but failed you in the end. Next time she'd make you shave your eyebrows too, she said and sent you back onto the street with what was left of your dignity. This girl sells the heroin you can't live without. She said she would donate your hair to a good cause like cancer, and I thought, trust you to find a drug dealer with a social conscience. I have learned not to ask why, but then I opened the door and saw you standing small in your nakedness, the kind of nakedness that can never again be clothed. I cried and cradled your head, while you, wise as ever, said, Mom, it will grow back, it's only hair, but your hurt goes deep. You were the child I suffered for, your long hair streaming as you ran wild into the wind with your imaginary friends. While other mothers snipped price tags off back to school fashions, I sat by your bed in the intensive care unit, watching your vital signs blip across a screen. You were barely 14 you'd had enough of being alive. I lifted your head from the pillow. The summer sun had streaked your hair faintly gold and brushed thin strands from your face. I could almost feel you want to live again by the grace as your hair slipped through my hands. I came prepared my hanky. <laughs> Something about crying at your own poetry, though, it doesn't seem right. It should be, but it happens. As I said, I haven't had the nerve to read these, really. Um, and so this is a good test. I, I got through one. This one is a short one. Uh, morning you is what I do best. But this morning I woke to new snow and a message from you on Facebook. I love you so much, Mama. I'll call as soon as I can. You're alive. Snow obliterates our house under a downy shroud but you're out there living. Well, she died on uh, September the 8th, 20, what year was it? 20, but 20, 21. Yeah, um, and I, this is the last poem I've written since she died. It's called Postscript and was at the end poem in this section. 
Um, you know who Facebook spies on us? And, and this is there's another reference to Facebook in here, but if you talk about buying a new carpet or a truck, you'll suddenly get ads for this. Mm -hmm. Well, I bought her a black hoodie mm -hmm. to be cremated in, and uh, I started getting these ads with this girl wearing a black hoodie and with mm -hmm. this line that's in the poem. And I thought, wow, that's pretty, I don't know about Facebook. Anyway, turn off Siri. The day you were cremated, a girl modeling a black hoodie like the one I've chosen for you to wear lights up my Facebook page. I survived because the fire inside me burned brighter than the fire around me. That was the line. I hear you laugh at the irony as they fire up the retort. A laugh dragged through the ashes of a thousand cigarettes, tokes of crack, my sweet, dangerous, reckless girl. What could I do but weep? the way I did when you were four, butting out a Popeye candy cigarette you scored from the boy next door for showing him your vagina through a split cedar fence. I told her next time baby hold out for a whole pack, trying to be brave the way only a mother could. Now I carry you home in a plain cedar urn, the remains of all you, the remains of all you once were, reduced to the smaller portable size. Not even you would survive the fire this time. Your light and ashes now, formless as the divine. Mm -hmm. Oh, Sophie. <laughs> Most of you knew her. Uh, anyway, uh, so I got through them. So uh, postscript, put the kettle on. I knew there was a poem for my grandmother in here. Um, Uh, this, there are a whole lot of family poems as well, um, and this is one. The cup that cheers but does not inebriate, my grandmother would say, those afternoons at three while we waited for the water to boil. They sold her special blend, black, robust, at a shop on 4th Avenue. After she died, they stocked it until the tea, the tea shop closed and a coffee house opened in its place, offering herbal infusions for those with more tepid constitutions. I can still picture Granny, who came from a long line of warriors. In the middle of a good fret, she assured me there was nothing more comforting than a proper cup of tea. Milk in first, it rendered the tannins insoluble. A dash of milk, which meant a mere splash and nothing more extravagant. She taught me it was presumptuous to pour milk into somebody else's cup, a slippery slope to murder and beyond. <laughs> Next came sugar, at least six heaping teaspoons. The sugar spoon engraved with her family crest, a bloody dagger and I max sicker, which is I make sure. Even from her ebbing bed, Granny insisted we put the kettle on. When you are in control of nothing else in your life, you could still make a cup of tea the way you liked it. Strong enough, you wouldn't need faith to walk on it. Sweet enough to float a bullet. <laughs> the Irish and their tea. Uh, so, let's read one more. And I, I was asked to write a poem for Gordon Lightfoot's 70th birthday. And I had this poem already written for Leonard Cohen. So I just put, I changed it and put you know, Gordon Lightfoot's name, which is kind of cheating and not very nice. <laughs> In the book, it's for Leonard, but um, I remember being annoyed with Elton John when he did that for Princess Diana. He changed uh, yeah. a candle in the wind to, um, well, they, he rewrote it for her. And then there was a joke going around that mother, if Mother Teresa died, he would write a sandal in the wind. But I don't think that ever happened. Anyways, this is actually was for Leonard, but it's also for Gordon Lightfoot. <laughs> uh, there's a, there, it's another version exists out there. It's called Humility. If I had to be the underwear of somebody famous, I would choose Leonard Cohen to wear me. I would want to be blue because blue is a color you can feel. And how do you think I would feel being intimately associated with Leonard and his private, oh, this could so easily become a confessional poem, which was never meant to be. I would want to be smalt, redder and deeper than azurite blue, more like the dusky purple I tried painting the bedroom one smoldering evening when the sun was going down and my lover had left town and Leonard was on the front lawn wearing nothing but me. 
Well, thank you. And, and one thing, if you're going home, well, it's not dark yet, but twice this in the last week, I've driven home after dark, and I saw one bear and one cow on the side of the road. And how, what are the chances? Like one bear and one cow, they must be friends. <laughs> but so they're out there waiting to jump in front of your car. So just be careful. But it's not dark, so we're fine. Anyway, thank you so much for coming. And I think there, there are books somewhere and there, there's watermelon. I see. <laughs> And, and if I may, um, Angie is indeed here, and she says thank you for the birthday wish. Oh, that's great. She is. So she kept her word. <laughs> yeah. Good. Oh, guess questions, right? Yeah, does anyone have questions? questions. Most things are such as maybe you have answers. That'd be better for me if you had answers. <laughs> great to see all my people from my exercise class. I feel guilty when I don't go. Sally lured me because the day I found out I was shortlisted, lured me to Daddy Cool's for lunch instead of said, Don't, yeah, you can blame her. <laughs> then tomorrow we're going to Dodging Meats. I have a question. Where is that place that is a prison that was once um, the uh, when it had? Where, where was that? It's, oh, it's on Vancouver Island. Right. Oh, it's on Vancouver. Yeah, and there's a book called Quarantine that I found in the thrift shop that was all about, it was a quarantine station, that's right. For the, yeah, I remember there were leper colonies yeah. like, on the Powell River. And yeah, place. there's one there too, just on the okay. But Stephen used to hang out, there was a graveyard there, and there was a young girl who was nine, Lisa Gentile, her name was, and he was particularly, he just seemed, he felt really fond of the, you know, he, he would invent stories for where he had to, because he didn't know the history, but he, Spent a lot of time there. It's a really lovely place, I guess, if you have to be in a graveyard. Um, yeah. So, is that book for sale? Or yes, it is. So there's a table somewhere with books on it, but it is for sale. I think we have them in the on the other side in the kids section. Yeah, the kids section. Does anybody have any more questions? Well, I have to say. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think when you hear it read, because sometimes I don't, like there are poets I don't like, and then I go to a reading, it completely changes my mind, especially poetry that's difficult. Like there's some that I find difficult. Aaron Murray is one. And the Four Horsemen, who are what they call sound poets, they make a lot of sounds. And I think, what's that on the page? It never works, but then you hear them perform and it's electric. So I think they're a wonderful person. Oh, thank you. Oh, so sweet. Thank you. You guys are amazing. Aww. And what is there for you to read your poem? Sorry? What is there for you to read your poem? What is there for me? Yeah. What do I get out of it? Yeah. Oh, nervousness. Well, next day, I feel like I have a hangover because I think I get adrenaline and cortisol or something, some sort of chemicals. I don't know what they are. I just make those. I think those, David would know. Something that happens in my system and then I go home and I think, what's wrong with me? I feel like I had, I had been drinking all night and I wasn't. So, mm -hmm. so then I stopped. So I haven't been doing as many because I don't like that feeling. And I thought tonight, well, we're all mostly friends and why do I need to feel... I think it's just what happens. You get maybe if you have to make a do a lecture or anything, you you uh, your body gets. I don't know what happens. I don't know what the pro the body is a total mystery to me. The mind even more so, but <laughs> I don't know what's going on. So, uh, well, I was invited to and asked to do it. That's why I did it. I didn't yeah. say, Etchy, I really want to do something." <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's three months. Are you surprised that the audience uh, laughing or whatever? Does that surprise you when you read? No, no. Well, but would be surprised if they they laughed at the wrong places. <laughs> <laughs> and I often say, sometimes people don't know. You're not supposed to clap after each poem because if I read a poem, for instance, the poem is about Sophie, it wouldn't seem to appropriate to be clapping when yeah. your daughter dies. So I think there's a there's a, so it's best to clap at the end. Do you like your poems when you read them? I mean, does it, does your feeling about the poem change? Like, do you find new things? You like, should have should have done that sometimes. Yeah, well, not happened a lot. But I one poem I had an image of a what's it called? It was called forcing Narcissus, Narcissus, and I was thinking of the bulbs that people my grandmother always grew. You force them somehow they come out early, and but I had rice paper door in the poem and. Uh, then I was walking down Roncesvalles in Toronto and I saw paper whites for sale. I thought, 
paper white. That's what it was supposed to be paper white door, not rice paper door. <laughs> so in the next edition of the book, I was able to change it. But usually once, I mean, I rewrite so, so many times, sometimes 96, I think 96 draft is my most. So by the time it's in a book, I think there's one semicolon and this shouldn't be there. And I'm a bit upset. <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to say something. I don't know if, I, if that was a mistake or why I put it there. You notice these things if it's your book, of course. And then other people are always happy to send you, oh, on page 26, I noticed it. I tell you all the typos are in the book, especially it's a novel. You know, what can you do? <laughs> so, no, it's a funny thing, isn't it? I don't, um, this is fairly new to me, this book, but um, when I look back, somebody wrote to me, they'd found a copy of something that was published in 1972 when I lived in Port. And he wanted to know, you know, what made me write the poems. I said, I have no idea. I can't that's a long time ago. I have no idea what, and I just stopped. He asked me annoying questions over and over, so I just stopped writing. I think he had to do a paper probably for school. He's trying, trying to get me to write it for him. But it was, uh, I really didn't know, you know, what makes you write these poems. Well, yeah, it's a, and I haven't, I, I hope I start writing poetry again, but I just haven't been able to. But I did the piece on the hide potato, which is great. At least I finished something, did it. Where's that at? It's a, a magazine called Coastal Mountain. It's from Pemberton. Coastal Mountain, Coastal. Somebody gave me some copies. It's really quite a high-end magazine. Um, and it's about the West Coast. So there's a man, the editor is called Feet Banks, and he's a friend of my daughter Charlotte's. And uh, I think they have children the same age. And so he wrote saying, would you consider writing this? And so I had to do a lot of research, but there's so much written about it. So it's really hard to be original, come up with anything new about the except the origin nobody knows where it comes from there are about five yeah, theories so. that's one theory there's theories that it came from russia that it came from hawaii um that it was traded by the kaigani haida um but that's probably the most likely but where did they get it from so it's their issue for the summer is a vagabond issue it's called plus it's a vagabond potato <laughs> but usually my nonfiction is funny and I couldn't really find it much to be funny about a potato <laughs> i love potatoes but i, I don't see them as causing great hysterical laughter too much. <laughs> um, we have some great comments coming in. I, I just, just a couple, we have a Patty saying, thank you for sharing your grief. And it, it allows me to feel mine, which mm -hmm. I thought was really nice. Um, and a Wendy, a Wendy Pickin in Sydney oh. um, saying, so great to hear you and uh, that they miss you in Sydney. <laughs> so. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Jeez, connected to the world out there. Yeah. No, I get a lot of, whenever I read the poems for Sophie, I get, I remember at Seashell, there was a lineup of people, and all people who, whose children were addicted and on the street. And one mother said her son was sending her vials of his blood from London to say, see, there is something that she probably said to him, there's nothing of you left, or he made some comment that he would do, and, and that was his way of proving that there was. And I just thought, oh, Jesus, mm -hmm. because I had a great relationship with Sophie. We loved each other. I mean, she was never horrible to me. I mean, she was sweet that was worse like she was kind if she'd been really horrible i could have been mad at her but you know when she asked for money if i didn't give it to her so oh, it's okay mommy Lord, you've done so much for him. <laughs> why can't you be a horrid brat but um so some people I, and people just don't know it's so it's families it's a terrible toll on families and then we all know someone right an uncle a cousin seems these days and yet in the 60s growing up the drugs were you know psychedelics and you didn't die from them you could do too much but it wasn't the same as what's going on now and mm -hmm. so many people had a woman stay for two weeks at oh, her son overdosed on christmas eve from the village and she had to wait to get his body back and i can't even charge people at copper beach because i'm so upset when they fall <laughs> to start crying <laughs> and say come and stay at my house the house of the bereaved i hope it doesn't get around because i might all be it might become a full-time job <laughs> you know, for, which i'm not equipped to do david you want to go <laughs> Yeah, he would be. Yeah, he needs some. Yeah. Anyway, so I think that's again poetry for me is about connection, making connection with people. Because when you write, you, it's pretty lonely. You write by your, you're by yourself. So if if uh, through poetry you're, you you connect, you hope you do. But um, and it certainly does seem that in that particular area, when it comes to grief, there's an awful lot of grief out there. So I really want to write, if I do write something next, it's got to be completely opposite. I have to do something, I've got to find something that's, no, I don't know, it'll come to me if it comes. You wait for it to come and then either does or it doesn't. 
But how many years I've got left? Mom died at 93, so I might have 20 years. Take I take after her. Room. What's that? You take up golfing. Why? <laughs> we have a golf course. <laughs> it's mm. I think I could. I, I can't hit very far. I tried once and I got about three feet and then got mad because I don't like not being good at things. Like I tried to learn the violin when I was 45 and realized I should have been three when I discussed <laughs> it. It's upstairs. You have to do things with both hands. Oh, well, yeah, the, the brain was so. I just wanted to sit down and be able to play it and go and sit by bonfires and play fiddle music because I love it so much. <laughs> well, I guess it wasn't in the cards. <laughs> I suppose it's never invented the ukulele. Oh, really? Yes. That's, e that's, Sorry, easy. Ukulele. that's easy to play. <laughs> there used to be, was it Ken Leslie who wandered around town playing the ukulele? And blowing bubbles, giant bubbles. Yeah. How was that about? Was he just having fun? Or... He still does things. Yeah, he still does, does it. Giant bubbles. Mm -hmm. I remember it's you asking that question when he did it. I know. <laughs> some, some questions <laughs> never get answered. <laughs> <laughs> They think about that all the time. Yeah. Was, well, so he moved off island though to Comox or something. Is he, he doing a professor something? Professor in the States now. I just saw a picture of him being a professor blowing bubbles uh, in front of yeah. his entire student body. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really? He's like a neuroscientist. I know. Yeah. He, he, must know he must know something I don't know. Or we don't know. Yeah. Can't get over bubbles. Oh. Does he play the ukulele in front of the class too? I'm sure I know what the ukulele was. Well, there you go. I could try that. I like the ukulele song that um, the Muppets do. If you like a ukulele. No, I look at my granddaughter's Lucas, so we changed it from ukulele to ukulele. <laughs> she was a baby. That was one of their favorite songs. Ukulele lady like a you. Can you read another one? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's very sweet of you to ask. Um, it's like an encore. Yeah. I once went, went to hear Leonard Cohen, and he he played for several hours. By that time, I was wait, going home to clip my wrist. And then he said he came back for another forty-five minute encore. I couldn't take it anymore. He's a lovely man, but holy, the heart was there. <laughs> How could he do it? Uh, let's see if I <laughs> what I have that would work as a last poem. I'm to find one that's. Hmm. Exculpatory? It's hard, isn't it? Oh, here's one I like because I love kingfishers and I watch them all the time on the Sangin River. <laughs> and it was really alarming to me when the Oxford Dictionary, Junior Dictionary, took out the word kingfisher and bluebell and acorn. Mm -hmm. Robert McFarlane was an amazing writer. He, he um, one of my favorite books is, I think it's called Land, Landmarks. And in Scotland, they wanted to take an area of bog and make it a, and drill for oil. And, and they said, there's nothing there but bog. And he got the locals together and they put together a, anti-devastation handbook and it was you know in this spot the mica in this in the stream is shines at a certain when the moon is full and salmon come to this spot and the locals just knew that the, every step part of that bog had history or some couple were courting there and it was at the, the 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 oil company never got to put their go ahead and said it was they won just from this this book i thought we could do something like that here anti-desecration anti-desecration handbook but this brought in so many languages it was so because there are the picts and the celts and so it, it he had the words were in, in so many different Celt or celtic dialogue <laughs> lets i guess and so here you'd have hide it but there's still quite a lot of words i think it'd be an interesting idea um if they ever decide to develop the muskeg anyway so kingfishers I, you know, I, he wrote a book about these words that were taken out of them. Uh, you probably have it in the library. Where? Oh, there's synchronicity again. <laughs> wow. I thought it was interesting too, in one of your poems, like the unicorn in the bathroom, you didn't want the unicorn. What poem was that? <laughs> the red one. The oh, the horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, of horse course. Yeah, they, you picked the perfect book. I had a dog. <laughs> I didn't have any foul. I do have phallus poems, but I didn't read any. <laughs> They're not in this book. Oh, no. Anyway. Oh, that's too sad. I want to find one that's not depressing. I mean, they're not. it's not depressing. It's just that they're sad. 
Oh, here's one I like called the, the True Beginning of Loneliness. I like the ending, the last five or six slides. The true beginning of loneliness is the moment before you were born, the moment you hesitate to reconsider before your head crowns, I know. And your second thought might have been, isn't it enough that the arrow fit into the wound it makes? But by then it was far too late. Years later, when I had come to believe loneliness is what I had been born to, I watched a master of Zen archery fit an arrow to his bow. He'd set up his target at the edge of a cliff where he took careful aim. The arrow sailed high over the target and plunged into the sea. The teacher looked at me, his inquisitive student, and shouted, bullseye, all I would ever need to know. I try to tell that story to my students, but I get it wrong. I don't say bullseye, I say bingo. <laughs> and, I, and they look at me and I go, I think I did something wrong. It's not bingo. I love that idea that the ocean is a, such a great sort of metaphor, I guess, for we, we think we have to be specific in our targets and work so hard towards one small thing where it's, where it's wide open. I guess that's what he's saying. Anyway, I, it was Esalen where he, in, in Big Sur, that place where it was the kind of the, the first place you went for healing, personal healing workshops. So Mike Megan went there for two or three months. It's amazing to think that Mike would do that. <laughs> Look what happened. <laughs> I asked Mike, I've been trying to get Mike to marry me for years because I want an Irish passport. I need a new passport. <laughs> but he has this dog and he says, would you rather be dead or married? And the dog lies down and plays dead. So I've got a hard, I'm going to convince him to change his mind. Um, he did say that if I won this prize, he would marry me. I've got it in writing, but I think he was he really thinks I'm not going to win. <laughs> but <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I won't hold him to it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's go and have some watermelon. Oh, great. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What poetry? What poetry? Oh, well, I read. Sharon Olds was one of the longest of poets. She's my favorite poet. And I, I met her once at the Vancouver Writers Festival. And I said, well, I stopped writing for I think, a couple of years because she was so good. I thought, if I can't write that well, I don't want to write. And she was horrified that I said that. But I, I did start writing after that. But she was really, really good. Um, well, I read a whole lot of people no one's ever heard of, mostly Irish and American poets. And of course, all my friends who write here Patrick Lane, I love, Tom Wayman, Lorna Crozier. Um, it's like being asked what your favorite book is. I usually go blank. Whoever I'm reading now, um, Margot Button had a schizophrenic son who killed himself, and she writes really lovely poems about that. So she sent me her latest book, and and, um, and uh, Patrick had a Lane had a posthumous book called I forget what it's called. It's really good too. I, I remember the title. Um, oh, who do I read? Jane Hirschfield. She was a Buddhist nun until she turned 38 and then she started writing poetry. She's wonderful. Oh, I have a poem. I just shared it. It's, I found this <laughs> somewhere. It's by, ha, I don't know how you pronounce it, Ha Jin, H-A-J-I-N. Does anyone know? He's Chinese American. And this is my, well, I don't know if I can, I'm very bad at finding things. Oh, it's on your photos. And uh, I showed it to Peter, or read it last night at dinner. It's called Miss Time. It's very short, but I just, I, so I looked at it for his other work and this was definitely the best poem. Um, it's about, you know, when you're happy, you don't need to write poetry. That's usually what happens. And I remember hearing a poet say that when I was in my twenties and I thought, what a curse. Imagine not being happy and then not being able to write. And she said, she just gave up. She didn't need to write. And I thought, I could not imagine. So this is what this poem is kind of about. My notebook has remained blank for months. Thanks to the light you shower around me. I have no use for my pen, which lies languorously without grief. Nothing is better than to live a storyless life that needs no writing for meaning. When I am gone, let others say they lost a happy man, though no one can tell how happy I was. <laughs> the risk of reading someone else's poem is that it's way better than anything I, you know, one could write, but I won't say that. But I just, that's such that ending, they lost a half, but no one can tell how, it's just perfect. I wonder how it's, it's in translation, but it feels really good. Yeah, and so it, living a storyless life, because someone had written to me who's, again, who'd lost a daughter to cancer and said, um, 
uh, that she taken Richard Wagamisi had said that story is all we have and stories are what is important to us, and et cetera, et cetera. So I like the idea that this, because that, when you have a sort of aspiring Buddhist practice and, and it, being a writer is the opposite. You pin, pin things down, you name them, you, you name every bird. And whereas if you were, I, I gather if you're practicing Buddhist, you don't need to name, you just let it all be. And as well, I had a Buddhist teacher once and I said, oh, there's a heron. And she said, right now, that's just a thought. And I went, oh, because I guess I wasn't supposed to name it. But the more, you know, when you see an eagle or a kingfisher, before you name it, it's, it's, it's pure. There's like a pure non-thought of just seeing that bird. And then you go, oh, kingfisher. And it's, it somehow takes it away. It, you're not one with it anymore. That's a kind of 60s idea, but that's, so to have a live a storyless life, I and mean, you could be happy in that, just just being, mm -hmm. I suppose, if you got to that state, which I have not yet reached. Mm -hmm. um, the story I make up stories about every single thing, so how I get through the day. <laughs> Perhaps it's something to, else to aspire to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Susan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.